This is the Math Map Book Club, where ordinary parents encourage one another to develop an extraordinary appreciation of math. We love what we know and struggle over the unfamiliar. Through weekly conversation and exploration among friends, we can begin to enjoy ideas that seem difficult. Join our book club as we discover how math helps us to know God and to make him known. Well, hello, I'm Lee Bordens, and it's Wednesday, November 8th, 2023. Welcome to the Math Map Book Club, where Kirsty Gilpin and I discuss a math concept each week from our soon-to-be-released math curriculum for families with students in classical conversations communities. Thanks for being here. Kirsty, what are we doing today? We are talking about complex numbers today, and while we have a lot of great things here to talk about, um, I was thinking about early on when you used to say, what do you love about math? Mm -hmm. And I just read this um, and thought I would share it. It was the possible replies to the question, why study numbers? And it says, here are some that have been given. Because teachers say as you must, because you won't graduate if you don't, because you have to take something, because it gives your mind valuable training and thinking logically, because numbers might be interesting, because numbers are a fundamental part of man's mental universe and hence worth looking into, because some of the most powerful human minds that ever existed were concerned with numbers and what powerful minds study is worth studying, because you want to know about numbers, what makes them work and what they do, and because mathematics contains some beautiful things and a few of the most ugly things, and because it is fun. And we know that we also were studying because it's important to knowing God, but um, just that idea of numbers, when we talk about complex numbers, we're talking about all of the possible numbers we could play with. Um, and I just thought that was kind of a fun list to share. And something for everyone. <clears throat> so here is our um, complex numbers. So we are um, this week, we have moved into ND, and we'll talk about that when we look on the math map, um, but we're going to talk about imagination. So we're talking about a new dimension, and we are also talking about complex numbers. And so we have this great image. Um, what do you guys see there when we think um, about imagination or complex numbers? What do you notice? You kind of have to imagine that it's going on forever because you can't see, but you can imagine, I guess, that it's going on forever. I see Fibonacci mm -hmm. sequence. There's two things that twist together. Yeah. Yeah. And within the darker one, there are multiple within that. So it's even spiraling off of that. So it's not just an abstract thing in that. That's also a mathematical. And then within that, there's this, it just goes on forever. It's infinite, it's infinity in almost every direction. Yes. I love the I love the trinity of three shapes in the black area. I was going to say, even though it's obviously very a very complex drawing, there there are patterns, there are obvious <clears throat> repetitions happening. I'm always curious because it says it's an untitled um, photographed by this guy, and I always want to go, well, what was it that he photographed to get this image? That's something you could do with the students is ask them to title it. It's a great prayer, um, right? Loving Father, I stand before you in the midst of confusion and complexities of life. My future sometimes seems distant and unknown. Give me, O oh Lord, the vision to see the path you set before me. Grant me the courage to follow your way. I love the path part of that because when you, as soon as you said that, I thought, okay, this picture is a symbol of just the complexity of the path the Lord leads us through. He says the way is narrow, and we can see it is a narrow way, this path. 
but it's beautiful and complicated and just stunning and full of life. <clears throat> It is good, isn't it, to know that even though it's complex um, and confusing, that that the Lord is leading leading the way. Any other thoughts you'd like to share before we? I just found it very restful, even though there is a lot of complication. That somehow it's it's a it's not chaos. It's a very restful um scene to me so it's calming i'm not sure exactly why but that's why it feels ordered well because maybe because of the order and the pattern that's inherent within it right that it looks chaotic but then you notice the order and the pattern that was used to create it and then the harmony of the colors right and sort of like that piece that passes all understanding that when we are looking at things, right, it seems so chaotic and confusing and we don't know why, um, but but God sees it, right? He sees the pattern and goes, it's all okay. So as we look at the math map and we talk about the language and order of mathematics this week, um, I wanted to talk about what is imagination. And as we're moving into ND, right, it's called imagination and space. Um, so let's talk about that. What is imagination? When you hear the word imagination, what is it? Think of imagination as being able to fill in the gaps with your own story. Okay. Good. Think of it as a gift from God. You no, know, we're not just pragmatist. It, it extends are being into that unseen part of him. So it's kind of like a bridge of connecting with him outside just the practical, logical, rational part of us. So to me, it's a real gift that God's given us and it's unique to each one of us. It's nice. I think hope and faith require imagination to believe that something else is possible and that you can that I mean, like God had to imagine things before he spoke them. And we were given the five senses to experience the concrete things. And maybe our imagination to experience the abstracts. I don't, I don't know. Right. So that's, oh, did, sorry, go ahead, Lee. Oh, so I think the word's a bridge because when we talk about image, we often think of the concrete thing, like God's image, we're made in his image and incarnation. But imagination takes it to the place where you go, oh, but that image came from nothing. It came from the thoughts and love of somebody. And is that nothing? Or is that a lot of something? Well, Jana did a great job pointing out that it's going beyond the senses. And I thought Babs um, did a great job of saying, mm -hmm. I know that it's going, it's an infinite pattern, even though I can't see it, right? And I use my imagination to recognize that. So um, Webster's Old Dictionary says that it's the power of the faculty of the mind by which it conceives and forms ideas of things communicated to it by the organs of sense. And so right when we break that down it's saying we're we're seeing things um with our senses right we might see hear feel taste smell things but how we make meaning of that is our imagination um or it's a more modern dictionary say it's the faculty of act or action of forming new ideas or images or concepts of external objects that are not present to the senses right so it's it's observing those patterns and recognizing, even though I can't see what comes next, that's my imagination. Um, it's the ability to be creative or resourceful or to think of new ideas. And I wanted to talk about it because a lot of times, especially with children, I think when we think of imagination, we think of things that are uh, make-believe, right? and stories, but imagination is more than that. And we need to 
make sure we understand that because when we talk about imaginary numbers, we're not talking about things that don't exist. We're talking about things that do exist. They're just not, right? We can't put our finger on them. So we have to use um, our, our imaginations. So when we think ND, what do you think ND means, right? It's different. We had zero, one, two, three, and four, and now we have this N here. What do you think that means and why do we use that term imagination to describe it? I'm thinking it means any number of dimensions. So fifth dimension, sixth dimension, seventh dimension, as far as your imagination allows. <laughs> Good, so that N can be any number, um, right? So could it be 3D? Does it include 3D? Yes, and 2D, but it also, so it includes the dimensions that we have studied, but it also includes all of those dimensions that we haven't studied. And so um, we have to use our imagination and that's what we're gonna do in these, um, in these, this week, when we talk about ND, we're going, what are the patterns that hold true for all these dimensions, right? All these things that we've studied and we've recognized these patterns, how does that pattern continue on to teach us about things that we can't experience, um, right? Because anybody here, have you ever experienced 100D? No, but I can say two to the hundredth power and try to figure it out. So there's a lot of things that Lee knows about 100D, right? She knows how many variables that there are. She knows how many different directions of measurement that there are. Uh, she knows how many different coordinates she would need to find a point, right? Or to find a vector. Um, but none of us can, um, right? None of us really knows what it looks like. We may have interacted with it, right? We may be intersecting with it somehow. And what we're seeing is some shadow of it, right? Just like when you see your shadow, the sunlight on you and you see your shadow, right? The, the pavement that your shadow is on is interacting with your 3D-ness, but in this flat way. So it's only seeing some- So is the shadow actually only 2D? I would say it is. <laughs> yeah, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> surely darkness oh my and light God. have some dimensionality to them but maybe not all right that is so exciting if a shadow is 2d it has no bottom right no thickness i mean it would have you know it would have length and width but no depth <gasps> I'm just gonna have a little moment here. <laughs> so, but that that helps us, right? That helps us to picture that if that our shadow, right, is right, it loses something. So we may be some shadow, right? There may be some shadow of the hundredth dimension, right, that we're seeing in 3D, and we, but all we can see are three aspects of it. Right, just like but now I can believe I'm I now I can believe as a 3D person in 3D space, I can believe I'm a shadow of 4D. Yep. I don't know if it's true, but I can believe it. At least it gives us something to a pattern that we can hang our hats on to mm -hmm. conceptualize what it might look like. <laughs> C.S. Lewis was right when he called us living in the shadow lands. Yes. All right, so. Oh, everybody in the world should be on this math book club. <laughs> That's geeks and lovers of the Lord. All right, I'm wait, there we go. Nope, it's still waiting. My computer's still waiting. It will change in a minute. All right, there you go. So we are entering into our final dimension, which as we just said, isn't necessarily a full dimension in and of itself. It's where we're looking at what are the patterns that extend through all of these dimensions. So, all right, so let's talk about 
complex numbers. And just like we've done um, the last couple of weeks, I'm gonna give you a minute to look at this, this little piece of the chart, just one little piece here and say, what are some things there that are familiar and is there, or is, is there not something that's unfamiliar? Axes are familiar, the labels are not. So just uh, kind of FYI, if you look at weeks uh, three to eight, we introduce the students to I, um, but we don't have them do anything but count some hops and move around on it so that they should should see it. Once we get to 2D, they've at least seen it once or, or a couple of times. Well, it's interesting to see arrows and then more like a curve or a looking like a parentheses at the end of the real number line to the well, right. It's supposed to be an arrow. Are you just? Oh, I'm sorry. My, I was all excited. <laughs> I thought I found a new notation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Good yeah. attitude, though, that you were excited about it and were curious rather than like, I can't do this. I don't know what that means. Well, I learned that the square root of negative one was I like three years ago. So <laughs> when we started now. the math map. <laughs> so it's become familiar, Babs, right? Right. Right. So there's a testimony. Sometimes our the testimony that we need to hear is the testimony of those who have walked ahead of us on the journey. And so Babs just said, okay, I didn't know what that was until I started with the math map. And now it's familiar. I'm not scared by it. It's become familiar to me. And so we have a testimony that when we persevere, things do become familiar. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, Babs, I bet you could say you're familiar with it. You're starting to get comfortable using it, but you still probably don't understand it. For sure. So, um, Let's take a look. There's a lot of things going here. I probably should have like hidden some of them, but on the left-hand side where I said the square root of negative one is I, and I'm gonna give you another definition for real numbers and imaginary numbers, that real numbers, when we square them, we get a positive number. Imaginary numbers, when we square them, we get a negative number. So we can look at it as taking the square root, right? Um, and when we're thinking about real numbers and we say, well, you can only take the square root of positive numbers. If you're dealing with real numbers, that's true. And then we say, if I took the square root of a negative number, I'm gonna get something that's imaginary. We can also think of it the other way. So I can, if you give me a number, I can look at it and I can square it and determine whether it's real or imaginary based off of whether or not it was positive or negative. Okay. And, and the way we do this, so there's a lot of things that I would like to share and I'm really gonna like not go there because there's so much fun, fun stuff to talk about here. But we're just gonna start off by looking at the square root of negative one and saying that it is, we're gonna define that as I. And we're not going to just gonna narrow talk about why, but we're just going to say I is the symbol we're going to use to represent the square root of negative one. And so if I do that, I can take any of those numbers on the left, those, those square roots of negatives, and I can rewrite them as the square root of negative one times the square root of negative four. And since the square root of negative one is I, I can say that has to be I times the square root of four. And when I do that, I know that the square root of four is plus or minus two. And so I can put it all together and get plus or minus two I. Okay. So I can take what I know about real numbers and real roots. And now I can use that to find imaginary numbers. Okay. So let's look at that. So we've got that the square root of negative one is I and the square root of negative four is plus or minus two I and the square root of negative nine is plus or minus three i, what would be the square root of negative 16? Plus or minus four i. Four i, 
right? And this is, here's, here's a joy, right? So if you were, um, had your students here, we could have written in the hidden one and it, it is just the positive one because we're defining it. Um, but we could go one, now I have two, now I have three, what comes next? Four, right? So even if they're, they're struggling with some of the notation here, right? Maybe they can follow that pattern here. Um, so what about the square root of negative 25? What, that, what would that become? Plus or minus five. Right. Plus or minus five. I. I. And then how about the square root of negative 36? Same. Right, plus or minus six. Square root of 36. So plus or minus six. Oh, you go right through that. Good job, Jana, doing your steps. <laughs> well, I saw that was missing. <laughs> now, could I do this with numbers that are not perfect squares? It just wouldn't be easy to figure out, but yes. Your last step would be. Uh -huh. All right, if I had something like that and I rewrote it this way, mm -hmm. can I simplify that at all? Well, not unless you're telling me I'm allowed to use decimals. And right. even then it wouldn't be equal, it would be approximately. Mm -hmm. Right. All right, what about something like this? Right. And that becomes, and now this is where, right, in mathematics, one of the things that um, Lee is always trying to do is, is to help students see the pattern, right? But because we try to write things so that they're clear, right, this is the same thing as I times two square roots of two, right? Um, and notice up here, my I is always written at the end, but when I have a square, the radical sign, I don't write it at the end because then I might think it's underneath. That's why I like my radical sign to be the last thing that I write. But then I don't like I to be at the front either. And so we end up writing this as two I square root of two. And that's one of the things that um, as over time, as students become more comfortable and familiar with numbers and recognizes recognizing the commutative and associative properties right they go oh well it's all the same right i can they're all th being multiplied so i can move things around and that's okay but it can feel uncomfortable if you're not familiar with that when we do that so i just want to acknowledge that um that that's definitely one thing i've learned from lee is to to slow down and and make sure it's clear why i'm changing the order of numbers mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I wanted to point out, like if you have a middle schooler or the, you know, challenge A, B, one student and they see something like this and they're so confused, don't make them do the math. But just say like, okay, let's read it. It's the square root of negative four and then I and the square root of four. And do you know what the plus and the minus are? They're plus and minus. Like there's so many ideas in there. And like, why did we write plus or minus? Well, because there's two answers. And mm -hmm. um, and then like Chris said, associative law, commutative law, uh, we just go over the small things so fast and then we wonder why they're confused when we put them all in one sentence. Mm -hmm. All right. So it's true, right? So, so much. And we, we neglect sometimes to, to acknowledge that. So let's look on the other side here. And I'm going to talk about the fact that when we have real numbers, right? We always start where, where do we start um, counting from when we want to plot a number on the real number line? Origin. 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 Right. So guess what? We still have an origin. Mm -hmm. That is zero on the real number line plus zero on my imaginary line. Okay. So I still have an origin. And um, so let's come over here and look at our numbers and notice up here, it says that these are two dimensional, right? So when we went back to 2D and we, we talked about X, Y, mm -hmm. right? This told me left or right, this told me up or down, but they were two separate numbers. When I'm talking about complex numbers, I still have a number that tells me left or right. 
I still have a number that tells me up or down, but notice now they're being added together. And so we have one number, right? I have two parts, but one number. I have a real part and I have an imaginary part. And every number can be written with both parts. So let's look at the first one, right? Four plus zero I. That tells me I've got four left and right. So one, two, three, four, and I have zero I. So this right here is four plus zero I. It's just one number, but is it also real? Right, this it's, is a real number. It lives on my real number line. So it's a real number, but notice I could express it also as a complex number, right? And so it's complex and real. Let's look at the next one, zero. So how far left or right am I going with zero? None. None. Zero. And then plus negative three I, am I going up or down? Down. No. Negative would be down. One, two, three right here, zero plus, sorry, I've got plus so that you could see we're always doing this, but negative three I, okay. So is that a real number? No. No, it's an imaginary number, right? Because it's on the imaginary right. axis, okay? So now let's look at the next one, two plus two I, how far left or right? Two to the right. Two to the right, and how much up or down? Two up. Up. two up. So one, two. So right here, two plus two I. Does it have a real part? Yes. Does it have an imaginary part? Yes. Is it real? No. Is it imaginary? No. no. Is it complex? Yes. <laughs> right. So that is just a complex number. It's not, it, it can't fit into any other number set. It's just complex, right? Now four. Question. Four plus, so yeah. with the with the ones that are on the real and imaginary lines, are you saying, are they real written in a complex form? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Seems kind of like just the, the, um, the identity law of, for addition, like four plus zero I is still. Four. Yeah, because zero times anything is zero, right? So yes. Like, wouldn't need to have that part. Exactly, right? So I could have just written four, but because I want you to see that every number can be written in its complex form, right? That's why we're writing plus zero. So let's think, let's go back and talk about four for just a minute. And I'm just going to, here's my Euler diagram, right? Here's my complex numbers. All of my numbers are complex. That says complex, even though it doesn't look like it. Then, right, so I have some numbers up here, then I have numbers that are real, and I have numbers that are imaginary, so four we agreed was real, then my reals are broken up into numbers that are rational, and numbers that are irrational, is four rational or irrational? Rational. 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 And then some of our rational numbers are integers. Is it an integer? Yes. And some of our integers are natural numbers. Yes. Is it natural? Yes. So this is just a reminder that four is a natural. It's also a digit, right? So if you're looking at the math map domains, it's also a digit. It's a natural. It's an integer. It's a rational number because I could write four over one. So it's a rational number. It's a real number because it lives on the real axis and it's an imaginary number. I mean, sorry, it's a complex number because it lives in the complex plane, right? So when we think about our numbers, right? All of our complex numbers live in the complex plane. Some of them are also on the real axis. And then some of them have even more um, specific definition than that. We don't break the imaginary numbers down the same way, right? We can talk about, um, that that sort of coefficient, it's not really a coefficient, but we can talk about what that part looks like, but they really, um, they're just all imaginary. We don't break them down more than that. 
All right. So they are so complex. They like are all complex. every number you can <laughs> imagine is complex. There's yes. nothing outside of that domain. Correct. There are other number sets that may specify different things, but the numbers, the bulk of the numbers that we're ever going to, to encounter are all complex numbers. Yes. Yeah. Percy, real quickly, go back a couple slides to where we see the domain, like maybe slide one or two. Let's make sure we're all very clear on that. I'm going to go forward because I think it might be quicker. Oh, okay. That's fine. Oh, you can go ahead. Yeah. So I was going to tell you, move my face, but I have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, because we ended complex before the letters get stuck in there. Is there anything we need to say about that or teach about that? Because I don't think you and I have ever even talked about it. Um, say that again. Well, we ended the gold C, yep. right, for complex in our domain this way, as though everything past it is not complex. But, I see. Yeah, so it's probably a conversation we need to have. Sorry, I don't want to befuddle the rest of you, but maybe you can think about it by the time we have our next uh, uh, next year's book club on um, monomials, and we'll be able to talk about that better then. All right. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> Can I ask just a quick question with the wording? So yes. are we saying that every number in reality actually is complex or are we saying that every number can be expressed as a complex number? It is complex. Every number is complex because every number can be written because it lives in that complex plane. So even if it lives here, so let's look at Here's another one, right? Negative three I minus zero I. So one, mm -hmm. two, three, here's negative three I minus zero I. Any number that lives on that real number line is in the complex plane. Okay. okay. So there's always this imaginary axis, even if we don't draw it. Yes. Okay. If we're in 2D, right? If we're in 1D, we can only look at one of them at a time. So when we did our 1D lessons, okay. we were always either looking at the real axis or as Lee pointed out, there's there's this time where we're looking at that imaginary axis and it's not until we get to 2D that we go, look, we can now look at them together. So okay. I have a, a question. Does that mean that you would almost do an X, Y, I on a 3D axis? No. <laughs> So, so that's where I was kind of, I was kind of cagey a little bit about, are these the only numbers? Because there are these numbers, like they're called, I think, quaternions, and it's 4D numbers, because I think I have not explored them in depth, right? So I am, I am speaking not from a place of mastery myself, but imagine if you took the square root of the square root of negative one. So now you're looking at the fourth root of negative one, right? How many there would have, if it's the fourth root, there have to be four roots, right? Mm -hmm. And so those four roots become the quaternions. And then if I was to take the square root again, right? Now you see where we're going here, where then it would be like the, the eighth dimension after that. So there are mathematicians who are studying those. We are not. We are going to I am glad. with the I'm complex really numbers in 2D. <laughs> That's good. I yep. I yes. Wonderful to know that it doesn't work that way. And I'm happy to let you carry that suitcase for a while. Jill, I just really happy though that you took a guess of XYI. That seems very rational and you know the part of the pattern. Oh. Rational. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, so again, I'm just gonna. I just came back here because I wanted you to see. Um, I'm just gonna quickly look at these because we've got all these other numbers. So I have negative one plus three i, right up here. Because I want you to see. Yes, that that does not look like a three i at all. Uh, <laughs> And then uh, we had negative three minus two i would be down here. And uh, one minus four i would be down here. 
And so numbers can be anywhere in that plane. And so I just wanted to point that out, whether we're talking right, that positive or negative is still moving us left or right or up or down. And so our numbers can land anywhere in that plane. And so there's an infinite number of them. Right. And that's mind boggling because there's an infinite number of reels. And now there's an infinite number of imaginary numbers. And then there's an infinite number of, of ways to connect them to create all these other points. Right. And so when we think about things being infinite, right, it's it's really right. The idea that, well, there's more, right? There's got to be more complex numbers than there are real numbers. Well, not really, right? I don't think there would be because we can sit there and we can pair them up. We can tell how to pair them up and show that they would have to be the same number. Isn't that bizarre? It is so. bizarre. So right. let's talk, answer Donna's question here. So you don't, I want to try to answer it so if I finally figure this out, Chrissy. So when you have two plus three I, those aren't coordinates like an X, Y, they name those two, there are two parts that name one, one idea, which seems weird after all the X, Y practice. So then that goes back to the first question I had, why is it a plus instead of a comma for complex numbers? So why is it we're almost creating an equation rather than a set of coordinates, even though we're using these like coordinates? Because we want them to be a single number, right? Because my coordinates are two separate numbers and they may be linked or they may not be linked, right? They're just a location, but they're not, they're not put together. Whereas with complex numbers, um, there's two reasons. One is that we want to be able to say, um, this is a single number so I can operate on it. But also um, because if I was to solve the equation, I've got to think through here, x squared, I might get this one wrong, plus x plus one. Let me do a better one. If I wanted to find the cube root of negative one, for example. That's not the right one. You keep doing negative I'm messing, eight. I was going to say, I, I'm thinking, but basically when I take the square root, when I want to find the roots of numbers, right? Um, like the cube root of negative one has to have three roots. One of them is going to be negative one. The other two are going to be um, complex numbers. And we're going to end up using the quadratic formula is going to be one of the ways that we could do that, right? And so we end up with that plus. So there's a lot of algebra that goes behind that, but there, these numbers aren't just sort of, oh, we're going to create this with a plus. It is numerically how they work out if we were to solve for them. So I'm going to mess around with the square root of negative eight later and you'll see what happens. You have to have three separate numbers, yet two of those numbers have two parts but they're only one number. Yeah. It's not, it's not two coordinates. It's would one you call number. it a, would you call it a point? Yes. Each one of these is a point. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so at the end, if you'd like, um, at the end, I will go through how we do that and how it, mm -hmm. how it, we get that complex number and you'll go, Oh, I see why it has to be a plus. Okay. So just a reminder, that next year um, you will be able to purchase the complex curriculum. If you're in challenge A, that will be a required resource. We're really excited. Um, we're also going to be having additional digital releases so that families can get started at home um, that want to um, in advance of us being able to have all of those levels released um, in print. So we are excited about that and we're gonna have new flashcards coming. Um, I was with somebody the other night and they said they'd had a glimpse of the notations flashcards and they said they were so excited about it. And I just thought mm -hmm. it was beautiful that somebody who was not necessarily mathematical was saw the beauty in that resource. So those are coming. All right. So we don't have a lot of time for this, but let's just take a look um, at, at one of these questions. What are the like terms? 
Right. So when we think about adding and we're all adults, so probably uh, most of us have had some um, algebra and you remember having to let, add like terms, right? When we're talking about imaginary, uh, sorry, complex numbers, what would make like terms or unlike terms? What, what do we need to look at? Would you say rational and imaginary? Imaginary and something else that starts with R. Real. Real? Real, right? So notice here, right, when I have um, my, my two complex numbers, right, 6i, they're all with pluses. And so what law says I can rearrange my addition? I'm never uh, quite sure. Associative. Yeah, yeah, associative. So so our commutative says I can rearrange it. And then my associative says which ones are grouped, right? Who do they associate with? And so notice that the first thing I did was I rearranged so that I had my reals, my six and my two. Then I would have had one I and two I. And then I looked at them and I said, Right, so there's an intermediate step that I'm just going to write here. Um, and because these are little kids, right? So we're not we're not stressing over all of the steps, but this is what happens. So I rearranged it using the commutative. Now I'm using my associative to create my groups. And now I can add together because I can add my reals and I can add my imaginary numbers together, right? So when I want to combine them, right? I mean, I can always add real plus imaginary, but it stays as real plus imaginary. If I have several complex numbers, I'm gonna, I can combine all of my real parts and I can combine all of my imaginary parts. Those are the parts that are alike, okay? Um, I am, we are, very close to being out of time. Um, and so we're gonna kind of not go through the exercise of completing all of these, but let's look down at the bottom where it's talking about how we multiply um, a real times a complex number and identify the law we're using there to multiply the numbers. Anybody wanna take a guess? Distributive. Yeah. The distributive, right? So, um, so notice that that these, right? So here, this is what I would be doing, right? I'm distributing um, in order to get my um, products here at the top, right? I was using those. So those laws still hold, right? For all of our complex numbers, right? The, the, those laws are true for all of them. They weren't just true for real numbers and they're not just true for imaginary numbers. They're true for all of our complex numbers. And our complex numbers, right, are truly a sum, right? But we, we think of them as being one number, but we can sort of break those numbers apart and look at those number parts individually, which is a little bit different to thinking about, right, um, other numbers, because we may think, you may think, well, I can't break four apart, but could I, could I break four into parts? How could I express four? What are two different ways I could express four as a sum? One, One. plus three. Four plus zero. <laughs> and two plus two. two plus two. Are there any other ways? Mute them. Mm -hmm. I could three commute them. Yeah, you could switch the order. And you could all do decimals and be yeah. infinite. Yes. Yeah, could you the root do of 16? Could you do negatives? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. 16 plus negative 12. I could have had 3.5 plus 0.5. Right. So there's an infinite number of ways. All right. And so sometimes we don't always think of that. We think, oh, that's four. It's got to stay together. But depending on what I'm working on, right? If I needed to break that into a sum, I can. And that's what I'm doing with these complex numbers. It's just that in our 
understanding. I wonder what it looks like in 3D or like from 4D or something, right? Is there an, a way that they're whole instead of just a sum? I don't know, um, right? But we just see them as a sum, but we can look at those pieces individually when we're calculating. All right, so um, I wanted to make sure that we had um, here, we're gonna be talking about proofs next week. That is November the 15th. Notice we are not meeting November 22nd. November 22nd. So the day before Thanksgiving, um, we will not be here. And then our we will be meeting on November 29th and our final meeting will be December 6th. Um, but on the 29th, that is our seeing the unseen week. And we wanted to invite everybody to bring an example of seeing the unseen to share. So, um, it and it can be anything, right? So that is a very wide open, but something you've seen um, sort of through that lens of mathematics while you've been working on the naturals. Um, so. Okay, well, thank you everybody. Kirsty, good job as usual. And uh, we had some exciting moments there with math. All right, I love y'all. See you next time. If anybody, if if Emma, if you want to leave it on for a minute, I will go back and work through this this uh, square root of negative eight. If anybody wants to see that, or the cube root of negative eight. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, let's see here. Hopefully, but everybody else can jump off. It may not be that exciting. <laughs> Okay. I've always I'm thought gonna... this needed to be longer, so I'm here. All right. <laughs> it's never, it never seems like it's time to end. Let me, I am going to erase what's here and, okay. So when, um, if I say, okay, I'm just going to give it a minute to, to, to like, <laughs> Decide it wants to, to work. There we go. Okay. I think I'm getting a new computer, so maybe it's going to work so much better next time. <laughs> Why won't you do, uh, do it when I need you to? All right. Um, I'm just going to give it a minute to catch up, and then we'll start. Um, Okay. So as we've been working through this, Kirsty, I've kind of been thinking of the of the I as almost like being a variable, like an X, like, you know, how you would add like terms. Is it wrong to think of it that way as you're? It's, so in terms of how you're treating it, no, that's exactly like it is a literal. And so I can um, treat it just like um, I would any other literal um x or pi right i would say it's more appropriate to think of it like a pi or an e um than an x because it only has one value right gotcha. so it's not like i can't solve for i right right yes um and one of the things so donna when you were asking about coordinates in x and y right i i can define a function that maps an x to a y, right? They are two separate numbers, and I can map between them using a function. Um, but I can't do that with the complex numbers, right? That's um, I. They're they're just a number. There's no function. I is not a function of the real. So so there's another reason why. So let me. I'm really sorry that this does not want to. Um, let me try. If I say so you could try just using the whiteboard, that's what I was going to do. So I'm going to stop sharing and instead let's try sharing the whiteboard. Okay. And then let me move you to the bottom. All right. So now um, I have X cubed equals negative eight, okay? 
And um, because if I solve this, what I'm finding out is x equals the cube root of negative eight. Okay. And um, so this gives me an equation that I can actually solve for x because this this is doesn't really get me to where I want to be. Um, but what this does, the other thing this tells me is that I have to have three roots or solutions. Let me just, sorry, I'm being mom at the same time here. Okay, so if I saw, make set this equal to zero, I have x cubed minus eight equals zero. And if you happen to have the charts already, you could look in week six, see, I have to look this one up. And on chart six, four, it has the sum and difference of cubes. And it says that the way that we would do this is we would factor this as x minus two, and then x squared plus 2x plus 4. Okay. So I looked that up. I didn't remember that. I looked that up because it's the difference of two cubes. One of these is easy, right? So this says that either x minus 2 equals 0 or x squared plus 2x plus 4 equals 0. So here I get my x equals positive two. Two, right? Which is it should have been negative two. So I did I, I copied something wrong when I did this. Oh yes, I did. Because when I add when I solve for zero, this would have been plus, this would have been plus, this would have been plus, this would have been minus. And then let me make sure that I copied this correctly. And then this is a minus. Okay. All right. So now I look at this and I go, I don't think I can factor that. But I have this thing called the quadratic equation, which is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared, b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And so here a is 1 b is negative 2, and c is 4. Okay, so now I can sub substitute those values in, and I get 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 2 squared minus 4 times 1 times 4 all over 2. And that becomes 2 plus or minus. So I end up with 4 minus 16 which is negative 12 over two, which is two plus or minus two square roots of three i all over two. And my twos can cancel and I am left with one plus or minus i square root of three. Okay. And so these are my, so now I, come over here and I say x could be negative two, it could be one plus i square root of three, and it could be one minus i square root of three. And those are my three roots of negative eight. And so um, any of those numbers, if I cube them, will give me eight. But notice, so this, but notice I actually solved and it was plus or minus over here, Donna. So that's why, right? Those, it's, it wasn't just that somebody said, oh, I'm going to create these complex numbers this way, right? Like there's so many things that we think men said, this is how math works, but it's not, it really is inherent in the very nature of the numbers themselves, right? That it has to be that way to make it work. So anyway, so I will stop there unless anybody has a specific question because that was that was very algebraic but and very quick, but I just wanted you to see where it came from. All right. Okay, well, I will look forward to seeing you guys next week. And until then, have a great week and have fun thinking math.
good. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>